So we are going to get started with this conversation, guys. My name is Colleen Rosenblum, along with Bridget Garrett. We are co-hosts of the podcast, Hot Flashes and Cool Topics. We are also hosting the group on Rebel called Hot Flashes and Cool Topics. Please consider joining it. We love questions. We have a group on Facebook that has about 40 almost 4,400 women. And the questions that they ask are so great. We're always like, oh, we've got to get, you know, we've got to find the answer to that for the, on the podcast. We've got to get an expert for this. So please join the group as well. Ask questions. We love to find the answers. We don't claim to be experts, but we will find the experts to um, your questions. And speaking of some experts, we are excited today to have Abby Greenberg and Maggie Sarachek, the Anxiety Sisters on. Hi, ladies. Hi, thank you for Hi. having us. We love being here with you. We just have so much fun when we are, you guys are two of our favorite people. But for those of you who don't, haven't met them before, the Anxiety Sisters have written a book at, called the Anxiety Sisters Survival Guide, which is kind of what we're going to talk about today. And also they have a podcast called The Spin Cycle. And in case you want to check it out, we were guests on episode 43. That's all I'm going to say. And that episode <laughs> went gangbusters. Oh. Really? Yay. Yay. Very big numbers. Very big numbers. Oh, people fun. like to talk, people like to talk to the hot flashes and cool topics, ladies. Well, you're oh, also yeah. very well received on ours as well. I mean, oh, you know, absolutely. Your anxiety one, great topic. Yes. Let's just keep going back and forth and being on each other's podcasts. Right. Huge numbers. Huge <laughs> numbers. Start, we should start a YouTube channel just all about anxiety and midlife, yes. and I bet you we would do gangbusters. Yes. We're but, into it. So I. <laughs> I thought maybe this time, because we have had you guys on before, we could start first with talking about number one, about anxiety for women in midlife, but then talk about the survival kits that you guys have spoken about. And what are some of the things that are essential? And then particularly, because some women suffer from anxiety over flying. Some women suffer from anxiety over, you know, empty nesting. Some of us are just general anxiety disorders. Raise your hand. So can we start with, <laughs> let's start either one of you just kind of talk about anxiety in general and why it seems to be such a predominant problem for women in midlife. And abs. I got nominated. <laughs> my anxiety sister went, your turn. Yeah. Um, okay, my name is Abby and I have invented anxiety. I mean, I am an anxiety sister. <laughs> Um, Mags and I have the patent on anxiety. Um, so, uh, what is anxiety? That's a good question. Uh, we think of anxiety as number one, not a good or bad thing, but a human thing. Something that if you're a human being, you have experienced it at some point or another. Uh, so it only becomes problematic when it begins to interfere with your ability to make your own choices about where you'll go, who you'll see and what you'll do. So that's sort of our, our, our garden variety definition of, of well, what the, what's the trouble with anxiety. Uh, simple definition, it's when your body goes into that very commonly known fight, flight or freeze response, right? When our uh, little, a little almond shaped feature of our brain's limbic system, the amygdala, it acts as our lookout, our body's lookout and it says, danger, danger. And then other parts of our brain go, okay, we're going to go into all systems alert and it hits the red button and your adrenal glands send out the cortisol and the adrenaline and we're off to the races. So that's the biological explanation of anxiety uh, and also the human explanation of anxiety. Um, why so much during midlife? Well, so funny that you should ask because we're doing a, a workshop tonight on hormones and anxiety. Mm -hmm. uh, for women particularly, when our hormones are in flux, which would be, you know, puberty, of course, uh, pregnancy, postpartum, menopause, peri perimenopause, menopause, postmenopause, like when our hormones are really changing, our estrogen or progesterone to testosterone, that tends to trigger the fight, flight, or freeze response rather haphazardly. So, because our bodies interpret not having the right balance of hormones as us being in an emergency situation. So it's really, really common for women to first encounter real anxiety issues when they hit perimenopause or when they get into their fifties and they're having those, all those wonderful symptoms that we sometimes get with menopause. And one of those symptoms could be a mood disorder, either anxiety or depression or both. Um, so it's, it's, it's very, very common. Mags and I, we have, uh, now we're up to like, 
I don't know, 220,000 people in our community. And I can't even tell you how often we hear from midlife women saying, I've never had anxiety before. All of a sudden I have it, right, Mags? Am I, am I right yeah. No, no, definitely, definitely. So that's that's a little bit about midlife and anxiety. We, we sort of come by it rightly. And also women are more likely to be anxious than men. Uh, one reason being that estrogen, the female sex hormone, is uh, positively correlated with the availability of serotonin, which is our feel-good neurotransmitter in our bodies, like that it's in our stomach and in our brains. The more estrogen you have, the more available your serotonin is for your brain to use. And so when your estrogen starts to dip and plummet and change, as it does in, men in perimenopause and uh, in pregnancy and in those other times, then of course our serotonin levels are affected and that can absolutely change our, our mood from very slightly to a full-blown anxiety disorder. Hmm. Go ahead, Bridget. I, you look like oh, you're no. I, I was just like, I, I, it's funny. I always said I wasn't an anxiety sister, but I think I am. Like I was getting very anxious today. I think, um, I know this probably happens to a lot of people when you pack a lot in your day and you don't feel like you're meeting the things that you need to do. I mean, I know that that's any techniques to deal with those situations. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things it's funny because Abby and I were, were actually talking about this today is that, you know, still in Western culture, we tend to separate the mind and the body, right? We, even if we say, oh, there's a mind body connection, that's separating it. But we, we were actually talking today about how um, the mind and body are they're not, they're just one, they're completely interconnected. So when we're in a situation like you were talking about where, you know, you, you're feeling stress, basically, you know, garden variety stress, your body can interpret it as sort of that anxiety that goes into fight or flight. And so all the hormonal things that happen when you're having anxiety happen in that situation. And so part of what you know, we always think about is there's sort of how I can manage it, you know, um, what I think about and how I structure my day, but there's also, you know, what can I do to sort of signal to my body that even though I'm having a very full and stressful day, I'm not in fight or flight, you know, and so that's different things for different people, you know, it might be some, I hate, deep breaths, you know, I know some people don't like when we say deep breaths, because they're like, don't tell me to breathe. But you know, if that if that is something that works for you, it that might be, you know, in through the nose and out through the mouth is signaling to your body, it's signaling to the systems in your body, you're not in fight or flight, that might be, even though you have a lot to do, I'm going to take a five minutes outside. You know, I'm going to make sure I have eaten um, protein and, um, that, so there's so many different things that you can do, but basically you're trying to s signal to your body. Like I am not in fight or flight. It might be like you have some lavender around you sniff. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of different little techniques you can use. And, and speaking of all those techniques, our favorite, our signature technique is the spin kit, which Colleen was talking about our survival kit. Um, one, one thing Mags and I believe in so strongly because of how impactful it has been in our own anxiety management journeys is the idea of preparing for anxiety. We believe in that. We believe in prepping for panic. And I'll tell you why. Because the most insidious, awful thing about anxiety is that it shows up when you're not expecting it. And so you're standing in the grocery store, you're minding your own business, looking in your grocery cart, thinking about all the different things you're going to put in the dinner tonight or whatever. And all of a sudden your heart starts racing or you're dizzy or you're feeling nauseated or you feel like you have to get to the bathroom quick. And you're saying to yourself, wait a minute, I'm just standing in the grocery store. Why is this happening? That very first, why is this happening? Sets off the chain reaction that can very quickly escalate our anxiety from you know, a hair, uh, maybe a little bit of a trigger to full blown, oh my God, I might die. Mm -hmm. 
because that's what it feels like, right? The more the symptoms intensify, when we pay attention to something, it grows. So if I'm saying to myself, why is my heart beating so fast? And if I'm standing in the grocery store, guess what's going to happen? My heart's yeah. going to beat faster. And so my heart will beat faster. And I'll be like, oh my God, now I can hear it in my ears really loud. Ah! And it just keeps going. Okay. So it's that element of surprise that leads us to ask that question. What is going on here? Why is this happening? If you carry a spin kit, which is a portable first aid kit for anxiety with you, wherever you go, what you're essentially saying is I'm ready for you. So when it happens, you're not going to say the first thing you're going to is not you're not going to say oh I wonder why this is happening you're going to be like oh okay I have this kit to help me I am prepared for this so when we don't get sucked into that why what's going on is this something wrong with my body is this something you know when we don't get sucked into that loop we take the intensity way down so that's the reason we believe in preparing for panic we we call it a spin kit because um, as a communication researcher in my first career. I really learned um, the power of language in terms of how it shapes our experience as human beings. You know, we don't really know how we think about something until we name it or until we talk about it. And then suddenly we've given it characteristics, we've given it a title, et cetera. So our, our labels are really, truly important. Um, it, if you want to see how this works, hang out with some kids and, um, and Talk about an event that you've all been to. I just did this recently with my grandkids. Um, if you say to them, um, what did you think of that really fun dinner we went to the other night? They're all going to smile and go, oh, so fun. If you say to them, what'd you think of that dinner that we went to the other night? They're going to all say, oh, yeah, not good. It's, it's, you know, it's that experience that we're giving a name to. So when we say spinning, we are replacing anxiety because to us, anxiety or panic those are commands that our brains hear. So we like to replace that term with spinning, which is our metaphor and our description of the experience, which also gives it a slightly cartoonish feel. So we can feel more like the Tasmanian devil and less like someone who belongs in intensive care. I mean, at least for us, it's, it's a little bit of a lighter, gentler version of the term anxiety or panic. So that's why we call it a spin kit. Um, so Mag, tell them what's in it. Okay. Well, so basically, if you were Bridget today um, and needed needed your spin kit with you, it's you want to have um, things to soothe your senses. Like I said before, soothing your senses can really give you that feeling um, that you're not. It, well, it can signal to your brain that you're not in fight or flight. So that might be, you know, something that you smell that is that is comforting to you. That might be. Um, I don't know, something to touch, like a worry stone, you know, that, that is comfortable to carry, you know. Um, so you want to have things for you to soothe your senses. You also want to have something to distract you a little bit um, from what you're, you know, so you might need a few minutes of distraction. That might be, you know, for Abby, it's looking at pictures of her cats often. For me, it might be doing a little bit of- I have to say that with so much disdain. No, no disdain at all. But it, it wouldn't, I'm scared of her cats, so they terrify me. Um, so- um, They wouldn't hurt a flea. They're very scary. So, um, you know, for me, I might have a little crochet with me. Um, someone else may have something to do coloring in, something that feels a little bit distracting. And then um, you want to have some sort of, if you're having some symptoms, you may need some symptom relief, you know, if it's your stomach or your head, depending on what is going on, you may need some symptom relief. Um, and I think for someone like you today, maybe it would have been helpful to have a mantra card that said, you know, I'm okay, or just breathe, yeah, just breathe, <laughs> or, you know, I'm, uh, you know. I'm all right. I'm okay. This will pass. Whatever would help you. Mm -hmm. And so that you could have just like had that up, propped that up and looked at it from time to time and said it to yourself. So those are the kinds of things that we often suggest. But everyone's, everyone's spin kit will be different. So like mine will have pictures of my sweet, fluffy cats that wouldn't hurt anyone. And then Maggie, if I had those in her spin kit, that would cause her to panic. So she wouldn't have that in her spin kit. She would have crochet, which I wouldn't want in my spin kit, but I like a fidget spinner. So everyone has different things in their kits. 
I already feel better. <laughs> I already <laughs> feel better. I was, I was really just moving since the, you know, when I got up this morning. And so I am already just starting to feel a little bit better. So thank you. Yeah. There you go. It worked. Um, oh, 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 someone there's asked. a question. Yeah. I was just gonna say, yeah. there's a question of, can you give some, you know, when they say symptom relief, my anxiety um, is expressed in stomach issues. Yeah. I, that gut brain connection, like I'm on a freeway straight. There's no stop signs, red lights, boom. So if you did have problems with your stomach or you did have some gut issues, what would be some symptom relief for that type of anxiety? Well, that's me too. So I would have maybe a, a type of a tea, even a tea bag with me. So I could go somewhere, get some hot water if I'm not at home, um, like ginger tea or peppermint tea or gas X or I'm whatever helps Tums. your Tums. A lot of people whatever. get heartburn. So they use Tums or whatever. Those, the chewable Pepto-Bismol people. Yeah, say. Whatever helps your, your um, symptoms, you know depending on what helps you. That's why we always say you sort of have to experiment with your spin kit a little to see what things are going to be helpful in there. Um, I know I get very hot when I get anxiety. I, um, and, and for some people, our temperature even rises. They've actually done some interesting studies lately about that. So I'll have one of those cooling towels with me, you know, that you just put under the water and it stays cool. Oh, that's smart. Okay. So, and you're not talking about a big box you're carrying around that says oh. anxiety relief kit. You're just talking, there you go. Okay. So it's like a free, a kit. free Lancome thing that I got like a hundred years ago when I bought $30 at Christmas, they gave me, you know, this filled with two lipsticks. So the lipsticks run out and, you know, you can put stuff in it. I mean, you can use a Ziploc bag. It doesn't matter what you use, you know, any portable can, though. Yeah. Anything you can carry with you. And it, you know, and it, and it ends up being incredibly helpful. And I mean, I, and at the height of my anxiety, I had a spin kit both in my home and at my office. Mm -hmm. But just knowing yeah. it was there, just knowing yeah. you had that in your car or in your purse, that it was there that you could, you didn't use it half the time. It's just, it was there. And I think that's so important because when you have a panic attack or you have an anxiety attack, you feel like you're losing control. Yeah. So if you have something that gives you just a little bit of control, Maggie, can you talk about that? The feeling of losing control when you start to go down that anxiety yeah. road? Well, it does. I mean, part of the reason we always like to call it spinning is because we say it, it feels like, like, you know, your older brothers have shoved you in the washing machine and the spin cycles on and you're, you come out and you're disoriented and wet. Not that my older brothers did that, um, but you're disoriented and you're wet and you're, you, you just can't, it, it feels like someone one time said to me, it feels like there's sort of an earthquake, but it's inside me. Um, and it's so much about losing control. Um, so what happens often when we're losing that control is it's really hard at that moment to think about what will soothe us because we're just trying to survive and we're not really using this like frontal lobe, this reasoning part quite as much. We're just trying to survive the, the feeling. So having saying, oh, okay, but I know I have my spin kit. So let me, let me go in here. And this stuff is already laid out for me. This is already there. Like, I, I don't have to think right now. I just have to grab something. You know, maybe it's a mantra card. Maybe it's, you know, whatever it is that's going to help you. Um, I just grab it. And, and it helps me to know that, you know what? I put this together. So I do have some control over this situation. I do have something I can do. Um, there's a question. What if you haven't learned how? to get relief for your symptoms. Are there any suggestions for butterflies in your stomach? It's interesting, butterflies in the stomach. Um, I, I was a public, I taught speech communication for many years. And so my students were terrified of speaking in public. That was just something. And, and they, would, they would come to me literally in tears. And these were college students saying that I, I, my butterflies in my stomach, they don't even feel like butterflies. They feel like tarantulas with knives. I mean, it's, it's not pleasant at all. And so um, I, I read up on what to do about that because my students were so distraught, particularly about butterflies in the stomach. So it turns out that there's two things that really help butterflies. One is chanting. Chanting, for whatever reason, seems to ease that 
fluttery feeling that we get. And so you can chant, you know, a, a nursery rhyme or, you know, you, a song or anything you want to, or just hum like a, a note over and over again. But apparently when we do that, uh, the way we stimulate our vagus nerve actually sends signals to our gut to, you know, calm down, stop contracting, everything is okay. So chanting is something you can physically do. And another thing is four, seven, eight breathing. So four, seven, eight breathing is a technique. Um, Andrew Weil actually came up with it. And it, um, you, you breathe in through your nose for a count of four, you hold your breath for a count of seven and then out through your mouth for a count of eight. And it can be a very fast four, seven, eight, just the idea is you want the proportion to be roughly that it, doesn't matter how long the seconds actually are. So, you know, like, like in, hold, out and do the, a few of those that also does something to the vagus nerve and causes those, those contractions in your stomach, which are the butterflies to ease up a bit. Those are two techniques. There's other breathing techniques you can do. I saw somebody put in the chat question about tapping. I was just going to say tapping has been known to help people with butterflies, which that's the emotional freedom technique where you find a pressure, a, a particular meridian or pressure point and you tap on it while you're repeating a mantra of some sort that can help tremendously with butterflies. Can you explain a little bit more about tapping? Because I think people well, will see it quickly, but what exactly does it do? Because you're supposed to kind of repeat things too while you're tapping. Well, you do. I mean, part of the idea of tapping was really taken from the the acupressure points, you know, the, those are the same points that they might use in acupuncture or acupressure massage. So it was really taken from those points as um, someone, someone asked a question about, um, which we'll talk a little bit more about derealization, like that feeling that you're out of yourself and tapping is one of those things where you're touching certain of those pressure points that like in acupuncture or acupressure massage is supposed to sort of be able to calm your system down. And then yes, you, some people do it with repeating, um, you know, you repeat certain affirmations in a sense. Yeah. Um, some people do that. The one thing we, we actually do talk quite a bit about tapping and I, I, um, well, I am a social worker in my former life. I worked, um, I trained with, with a place that worked with victims of torture, um, political torture, so that then when they came here often, you know, they had all these symptoms of not being in their body, which they had to have to survive. And tapping was one of the things that um, they really worked with. Abby and I, and I'm a, I'm a believer in doing it if, it if it is helpful. When we were reading research, like sort of trying to really read through the studies on tapping. I have to say my, my only thing is that the research really uh, didn't bear out what I thought it would in that a lot of the tapping research was really based on the, um, really based on acupuncture. Um, so that they had researched like the acupuncture points and what point like what each point will do to your body, but we're not quite sure how much of that is replicated when you're tapping. Right. The, the, the long and the short of it is that the anecdotal evidence for tapping yeah. is very strong. And Mags and I do not discount the importance no. of that no. evidence. We, we believe that this, the human experience is really validating. So there are a ton of people out there who swear by tapping and really has, they found it to be tremendously helpful in managing anxiety. So we are not suggesting you shouldn't try it. Scientifically, they don't have the evidence yet for it, the quantitative proof, but that, uh, you know, we know that that doesn't necessarily mean that it, no, it doesn't. It yeah. doesn't. We, we talk about it in our book and, and it's a fairly easy thing to learn um, even from you, from our book or YouTube. It's not a whole complicated. Right. Fairly easy. You only to have to learn, you have to learn like basically 12 places on your body, you know, and it, it, it's very straightforward and, yeah. and you, you create a setup statement. So like a, the simple version that they use for the people who invented tapping the emotional freedom technique people, they say, even though I'm blank, I still blank. So even though I'm feeling anxiety, I am still okay. So you would, you know, tap against your karate chop right here and say, even though I'm feeling anxiety, 
I am still okay, you know, and you would do that and repeat it over and over again, tapping at the different points. And you would sort of rate your anxiety before you start. And then after you do one full cycle from one side of your body to the other on the points, and if it's not significantly lower, then you repeat it. Um, and, and you can do it as many times as you want to, uh, my, I tried to tap for my own anxiety management. And I found that what tapping was so useful for me was grounding me. Mm -hmm. Tapping was very good at bringing me back to the present moment. So and Max is going to talk about derealization or depersonalization as I know someone asked about that, but you know, anxiety can be very disorienting and it can make us feel out of our body. So one management technique for that is to, you know, wake your body up, be right back in your body. So certainly tapping or someone said snapping a rubber band against your wrist or, you know, um, tugging on your hair gently, you know, just something that kind of wakes you up and says, Hey, I'm right here right now can be very helpful in managing that disorientation feeling for me personally. That's what tapping does. It, it didn't help me with the actual anxiety component. Um, but it has helped many, many people that we know. Maggie, you were going to talk about the derealization. Well, we, we often, Abby and I often call it floating, um, but the derealization is that feeling that you're not quite inside your body. Um, and it's one of the things that, you know, I found incredibly scary about panic, you know, and, and I've talked to other people and one person said, you know, they were sure that they were, that they were in the beginning of schizophrenia when they, when they started to feel that way, like that's how scary it is. Um, but it's a completely normal part of the whole anxiety experience. And, and you will flow back sort of into your own body. Um, it's just sort of saying to yourself, this too shall pass, but there's a lot of techniques that help people. And most of them are sensory. I tend to love cold water for that. I put in cold water, either on your wrists or your forearms or, you know, something frozen on the back of your neck. Someone said the rubber band trick, which I've also done many times, you know, you have a rubber band around your, your wrist and you just snap it. So basically, and Abby does the tapping. So it's basically anything so that you can at least start to feel your body, that it doesn't feel separate from you. Um, but it's also for me, what really helped is knowing that this is such a normal feeling and that, you know what, it will pass. It may take a while, but it will pass. And there's things I can do along the way to help myself. But, you know, part of it is just, waiting for it to pass. I hate to say that. I mean, it's, it's thought evolutionarily, it's thought to be part of our freeze response, right? Yeah. So it's like when you feel like you can't fight an enemy or you can't run away from that enemy, then what do you do? You freeze, right? Or you play dead, hoping that the enemy will then leave you alone. So, it, 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 so that depersonalization or dissociation is part of that, that both freeze response and also flee because your body is sort of leaving the room. Yes. Like, All right. This is too much for me. I'm out. You know, so um, that the, the, it's, it's really just part of the fight, flight or freeze response. And it's very much something a lot of people get. And particularly a lot of people who had trauma in childhood or some sort of trauma, but many people who don't have trauma get it too. But a lot of people who have trauma, you know, describe almost being a child in certain traumatic situations. And if they were abused and sort of escaping their escaping out of the abuse. And so, um, you know, it was, but you certainly can get it without having ever been abused. You know, it's just a normal piece of anxiety. And, and someone was just adding to uh, grounding, like um, when uh, for epilepsy, how they do the uh, they stick the name of the things, the table, the chair, the and that I didn't I didn't realize that would help as well for epilepsy. That's really good to know. I you know so that a big grounding technique that sometimes helps people is you know they'll they'll say like oh what are five things I can hear four things I can smell um, or someone um, that we talked to recently says um, let me find five red things in the room you know if she's or or if she's in the car she looks out where where are five green things five red things five blue things so anything that is kind of distracting you a bit and bringing you back um to yourself can be really really helpful yeah i mean even more powerful than the distraction piece is that it it brings you into the here and now 
because when we leave our, when we do the floating thing, we're kind of going to a different dimension. Mm. So the, one of the ways to speed up floating back to your body is to, you know, be actively grounded to the earth. Like even walking barefoot is mm. a great way to ground because when you feel your toes connected to the earth, it's very hard for your, you know, for you to be floating away because <laughs> you are saying, hey, I'm here, I'm on the ground. That's interesting. The, the, um, it's interesting about the ep epilepsy because that's not um, an area I know a lot about, but um, even um, why you have those sensory things in your spin kit is partly because of the desensitization, de de realization. So it's like using your sensory, um, using anything for your senses. So for me, that often means like smelling something. Um, but one of the best things we always say is having a really strong mint with you, like an Altoid or whatever. You don't have to like the taste, but putting the mint in your mouth is very, very helpful um, because you just, you're grounded when you have a really strong taste in your mouth. I've also heard people say, literally sticking your face in like ice water. Yes, brings that's right what I was back. talking about. Stick your face, your your neck, your your forearms are very, very sensitive um, and your wrists to the cold water. You guys have mentioned the vagus nerve a couple of times and I, I don't know that everybody knows what that is. So can you explain what the vagus nerve is? Sure, it's uh, your body's longest nerve in the spinal, in the uh, central nervous system. It connects your penthouse brain the one we think of as our brain, with your second brain, which is in your gut. So many people don't know that we actually have two brains, but we do. Our, st our stomach, our enteric nervous system is our second brain, and it actually can operate all on its own. It doesn't need the penthouse brain to tell it what to do. It, dig it handles the system of digestion all on its own. Um, and evolutionarily, original creatures were only digesting organisms, right? They didn't have penthouse brains. They just were amoeba who ate things and then pooped them out. That's all they did. And so that's what the brain was, was a digestion organ. And as we evolved over time and, you know, the more sophisticated cell, cell functions, et cetera, um, happened, that's when we got our penthouse brain and it went, it has so many more complex functions, but the, uh, the enteric nervous system, if you open up your stomach and unwind the whole thing, uh, it's the size of a badminton court. So we need a brain in charge of that. It's a big area, if you think about it. And I think Mags is, is longer than, bigger than a badminton court, right? Because she, she has an extra twisty colon. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but, but anyway, so, so the vagus nerve connects the second brain, your stomach, with your penthouse brain, and it's a bi-directional highway for communication. So your brain is communicating with your gut constantly and vice versa. We don't know what came first. It's a chicken or egg thing. They're just constantly communicating together. And here's something interesting. You know, serotonin, that feel good neurotransmitter that we're always talking about. And that's the target of SSR and our, our SSRIs and other drug interventions for depression and anxiety. Guess where 95% of it is produced? Your stomach. Wow. Only 5% of it is found in your brain. So it's really, um, a, a, a two-way street and what's going on in your gut is a reflection of what's going on up here and vice versa. Mm. Now, I was going to say, what are some of the common manifestations of anxiety that you see most common in midlife women? Like, how do we express our anxiety? Because I know, like, I have two daughters who are adults. It is much more accepting in the Gen Z millennial um, generations to say, oh, I'm having anxiety today. But for us, there's still that mm. stigma of looking like we have it all together. So how does that manifest for women of our demographic? Anybody? Do you mean, how do we talk about how it? How do we or kind of express the anxiety or show, like, because we're always trying to press it down and make sure that it's not showing to the outside world, but how do we express it? Like, do we have more panic attacks? Do we have oh, more okay. suicidal good? God for ideations, like what is it that our generation seems to express with anxiety? Well, I think one thing is I, I, I was in a 
in a group, a support group the other night um, that we do called the coping crew. And um, the women in this group are all happened to be mainly women who were, you know, around our age and they, and a few of them were taking care of parents who were ill and kids. One had a had ill parents and an ill child, you know, a child with type one diabetes. Another had a husband who was struggling with uh, physical illness and, and a parent. And so, and they were working too, right. you know, and so it was, you know, and so that they were talking about this feeling of never doing everything right you know, that feeling of a lot of shame and disappointment within themselves because they couldn't sort of get it right. What they were trying to do right, I don't know who could do that. You know, it was, there was so much responsibility. Um, and that feeling of a lot of physical manifestations of the anxiety, um, you know, aches, whether that's like the bare aspirin commercial or the stomach problems, but it was both like a lot of shame and a lot of physical um, manifestations. And so one of them said like one day that she thought I should go to the ER, but she's like, but I can't go to the ER because, you know, I have to pick up the kids from practice and then I have to drop dinner off for my mother. And then I, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, she was, she was actually just having panic. She didn't need to go to the ER, but it's even that whole idea. I think I need help, but I don't have time to get help. Right. That's what I meant, because I think a lot of women of our generation think we have to do it all. And we are the sandwich generation. Yeah. And when you hear kids say, oh, I need a mental health day, that's not something we would ever say. Like we wouldn't turn to our aging parents and say, I can't take care of you. I need a mental health day. You know what I mean? That's just so it's got to manifest in migraines and high blood pressure and things like that. So that's yeah. pretty much what I meant. Yeah. No, you know how it also manifests for a lot of women in middle age? Uh, something called fawning or people yeah. pleasing, yeah. excessive people pleasing, where especially when we are in between generations and we've got children, maybe grandchildren, parents, you know, ill friends, whatever, we have so much caretaking responsibility. Plus, we're one of the people who supports the family financially, plus, we are keeping the house or whatever we're trying to keep afloat. So the, all these things are going on. And um, one response that isn't talked about very often in the literature, but it's considered the fourth F along with fight, flight, and freeze. It's also fawn, which is this need to, to keep the peace by pleasing others, even to your own detriment. And I imagine every woman in this room knows something of that, because I think as women in general, no matter what age we are, we have some socialization in that regard where our needs are not supposed to be as important as other the people's needs that are that we're taking care of so i think that that's sometimes uh, you know a problem with the patriarchy so to so to speak but i think a lot we, mags and i've talked to so many middle-aged women who who talk about they they just can't do it anymore they can't please their kids and their parents and the pta and the the church all at the same time there's just too much too many demands that are being put on them from every part of their life and what they've been doing all along is saying yeah i can do it i'll do it i'll take care of it I, yeah i don't need a break i'll do it and they're at a point where it's not physically possible anymore we just can't handle it we'll break down right so i think we see that response a lot as well yeah, because the yeah. chronic stress that is on people who are in this kind of sandwich generation often, or this this idea of chronic stress, like chronically having these days where too much is packed in, or you have too many people to be responsible for, that chronic stress does change your hormones. You know, it, it you you get you have more cortisol being secreted, more adrenaline. I mean, there's a there, so it's actually very physiological that it um, changes your body. Um, you're more likely to get inflammation. You know, all these different types of issues happen from that chronic stress. And I think a lot of middle-aged women, you know, are dealing with that. It's the and muscle I, tension starting up when something's yes. stressful and your shoulders clench up and you're and you don't even know you're doing it. Your jaw clenches up and 
and then you're thinking, oh, and then you're sore all over and then you're in pain. Right. Right. Yeah. It feels like and for work. many of us, it's been years and years of clenching our jaw. And then suddenly we end up with that TMJ, right? That, mm -hmm. that thermomandibular joint disorder, because we've been gritting our teeth for so long that that happens. You know, it's like when you, you know, when you get to in your fifties, it's, you know, some of the parts start to <laughs> start to give you trouble here yeah. and there. Right? Yeah. They break down and they, you know, for, they make need a little refurbishment sometimes. So, yeah. you know, it, so things that held up really well in our thirties under stress held up less well in our fifties. Right. Mm -hmm. We have to find different things in our survival kit. Yes. There are a lot of brands out there that now carry like tinctures, tinctures for stress, tinctures for anxiety. Number one, what, if you're looking for those, what ingredients should be in them? Because what works, I guess, is my question. If you're going to put it in your survival kit. We, we happen to like, we have no affiliation with these people whatsoever. We happen to really like box rescue remedy, okay. um, which you can get on Amazon. You can get it at whole foods um, and probably other places too, at this point, GNC, I imagine it's um, box like a box. No, B -E -A. B -E -A -C -H, box rescue okay. remedy. They make it for pets too. What we like about box is that it can do no harm. It literally has never had a side effect for anyone ever. Right. And it doesn't, inter it doesn't interact with any other medications, yeah. any like, medications. And it tastes good. They're like little, I like the, they're called, they call them pastilles. You know, they give them a little French name, makes it sound better, but you know, they're basically just suckers, but you and can also, sprays. yeah, that you can spritz and it, and it, some of it has some lab, a teeny bit of lavender in it. So it has like a nice aroma. I always carry it with me. Like I said, we have no affiliation with them, although we wish we did because we probably sold a lot of it for them over the years, but B A U or B A C A B A C. I'm gonna I'm gonna put it up in the chat. Thank you, thank, thank you. you. The rescue and, remedy, like you could spray it in your mouth and stuff like yes. that. Right? Yes, okay. yeah. They have they have you can suck on it, you can spray it in your mouth. They have like a lot of different products now. Right. Um, and they have it for pets, and people swear I have never used it on my pets, uh, but m people say they're that it's really great for their pets, that it calms them down during I, thunders. Yeah, yeah, thunder lightning. It works well, for me. It's, made, it's all made of like flower extract and it's all yeah. natural. And like I said, has never had a single interaction for a single person in all these like, years and years and years. So, cause there's a lot of tinctures on the market that put in ingredients that some people might be allergic to, or that, you know, in, in certain quantities or mixed with other herbs can cause a reaction. So I, you know, we're, we're hesitant, Mags and I, to recommend anything yeah. because of that, but Box Rescue Remedy, we feel comfortable recommending it to every single human and animal. Right. I mean, there's definitely a lot of things out there and some of them either are sort of made up or, you know, you have to be very careful if you're on other medications that there's no uh, interaction. And so um, someone's also putting in something about Highlands, Calms. Um, and that I, I do know that brand tends to be a very good brand. Um, Highlands. So just so. check with your doctors before yeah. you take anything. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you I mean, really like box, you don't have to check with your doctor because yeah. it's, it's so benign. Yeah, <laughs> it, really, it really helps. Like also, if you're someone who has, say, phobias, and so you might be getting on a plane or going in the car to drive on the freeway or whatever your phobia is, um, having that with you, it can be really helpful in so many ways to help. I mean, it's, part, it's really partly aromatherapy, but it's, it's, it's very, very good. They have a new flavor out that I love. It's got bergamot in it, which is my most favorite thing right now. Um, it's, I don't know. It's my new trend for me. I was always a lavender girl, but now I'm going with bergamot. So I highly you recommend. Did, you did put in box. I know Teresa yeah. just asked and it's right above you. No, no yeah. worries. No worries. I just want to make sure no everybody. Yeah. She wrote, I was just going to retype it, but yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So if you're getting on, you know, if you're getting on a plane or you know you're going to be somewhere where you don't have access to escape, because yeah. I think that for a lot of us, anxiety happens. Like I remember being on a plane on the runway, we were delayed. And for some reason, the pilot or the people, you know, the stewardess said, ha felt the need to say, we are locking the bathrooms so nobody can use them. And I remember saying, well, why would you tell me that? Because now I have to go to the bathroom. I didn't before, but now I do. And so when you get to that point and you open up your survival kit, 
you've got your rescue remedy in there now you've got your maybe a, a cloth that you can use cold water you've got maybe some peppermint or some lozenges or some candy that has a strong minty scent to our minty taste you could do some grounding where you're picking out things i count i don't know why but that day i actually will never forget i counted to 1152 singularly that's, counting so i wouldn't grounding. lose my mind that's a that's grounding, grounding. Technique. Or, or or abby um when we were i think we have it in our book we we're writing our book and she said well you could count back you know you can count backwards by certain numbers skip like six or count backwards yeah, by i said six. we should count backwards by seven that's what i do and mag's like abby that's not what normal people do and, uh, no i would <laughs> and it wasn't because it wasn't because of the counting it was because i was like there is no way I would know how to do that. I'd be like, okay. You're just getting a little yeah. extra brain nice. work in there. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. It could be yeah. the alphabet in reverse. You got to think about it. Or um, if you have a big family, try to list all your cousins in age. Or <laughs> or I mean, I'd be there all year. Anything, anything that right. gets your mind. You want your mind to do tiny bits of work, but you're obviously, when you're anxious, your brain can't really function. So you don't want to do a, the New York Times crossword puzzle. But, you know, I have this little... Um, someone gave to me it's a uh, do you remember when we were kids there was that magnetic guy with the little stick and you could yes. his name was Wooly sure, sure. Wooly, he made Wooly his, or something he like gave that. him his yeah. hair and because he yeah. had Wooly something Wooly, Wooly. anyway you used to have this little red thing with a magnet and you could make, give him a mustache and a goatee and you could make eyebrows well somebody gave me a tiny one and I keep it in my spin kit because that's the perfect thing you don't have to think too hard but you can go ahead and make a face with hair well, it is also why I I started cross stitching um, when I was in cars because I would I would be getting such terrible anxiety and and that was kind of an easy thing to do and then I moved to crochet and so I will not get on a plane if I don't have like a little bag with some crochet in it because that kind of keeps my hands busy and for those times when you're stuck on that runway which we yes Wooly Willy sorry yeah. thanks Bobby Wooly <laughs> Willy yeah. that's him. Someone said, I'm having anxiety now as a single parent with a 13 year old hormonal teenage boy. Oh, good luck. And it's rough. And I was late because I was dealing with him. We all get it. We all get it. Yeah. We all get it. Yeah. We all get it. I think, I think that's a moment of self, where self compassion is a great yes. tool to yeah. just say, you say to yourself, you know what? I am doing the best I can. And this is a human thing. This is a mom thing. This is a caretaker thing. This is also a teenage boy thing you know we, it's, we, we, all, struggle. we all struggle with this we it's, all struggle with these things and it's okay to be late it's okay to stop and take a breath and to have some compassion and treat yourself as you would a really dear friend say it's okay it's okay we get it it's all right we can we have time for that <laughs> right and that sense of connection to you know saying that and like you can see that you know Abby and I certainly probably all the other women in this group, everyone's like, oh yeah, I get it. I absolutely know what you're going through. I okay. absolutely get it. It's like, you're not alone in any way, even though at the moment it feels like you're alone and just saying it out loud. Like I admire that because that is the first step in sort of connecting with other human beings. Like there's no answer to a 13 year old hormonal boy. <laughs> <laughs> there's not an answer and I tell you it, it's still even when they're 24 there's still no answer it doesn't get that much better <laughs> <laughs> wait Bridget yours is 27 20 29 29 what? he calls me every day. Nine, he has a 19 yeah. and a 15 we, yeah. we're all in it with you Teresa we are all in it with oh, you yeah. there is a community out there that absolutely yeah gets and, it. and there's I know that people feel like I know one thing I felt as a parent was that I was being judged so much. That's what I felt like. Yes. And that is one thing that as I get older, I'm like, there's got to be grace for other parents out there. We have got to give other parents grace because I mean, I'm a former teacher and honestly, I, I don't even know how many thousands of students I had. Most parents I've found are doing the very best they can. They really are. Yes. <laughs> and that, that I would say two parents maybe weren't out of the thousands of parents most parents are doing the absolute best they can. 
And it's I, uh, such a ridiculously hard job. Yes, it is. <laughs> there's no, there's no winning. It's so yeah. hard. In a country, it's, in a culture that gives a lot of lip service to the value of kids, but gives us very little resources mm -hmm. and community for raising kids, you know, shockingly mm -hmm. little. And so that's also in terms of the self-compassion, know that, that we've, we all have struggled in so many ways. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I'm sending you a big virtual hug, Teresa. Yes. If I were with you yes. right now, I'd have my wow. arms around you. And I would be saying to you, I'm so <laughs> with true. you. I get it. My God, I've cried those same tears so many times. I think we all have. And it's that feeling of isolation, like you're the only one in yes. it. You're yeah. not, I promise you. And then you get on Facebook and it's like everyone, <laughs> it's not real. Else is, oh, my kid is going to Harvard at 12. <laughs> <laughs> And they and they opened a soup kitchen next door. And you're like, oh my God. <laughs> you know, and it's like it, it's, it's do, you know, guys, do you guys have any groups or, or communities you might recommend to Teresa that like for teenage parents, so, you know, not teenage parents, but parents of teenagers, way different subject there. Yes, yeah, so uh, that is, yeah. And in, um, in per, you know, perimenopause pausal slash menopause oh. I oh. actually a, a week ago um seven days ago today I had my right ovary removed and my gallbladder mm -hmm. removed so oh. it's like um my horm you know my hormones are also oh, yeah. and 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 you know it's um it's yeah. a lot it's a oh. lot absolutely yeah. and it can be overwhelming yeah for you but remember you are also extremely hormonal right now <clears throat> And so is your 13 year old. So <laughs> that like does. Hormones are colliding. Your systems and clash. hormones are colliding. Yeah. Mag Maggie and I often say, we stole this from someone. Who did we steal the nervous systems bumping up against? Barbara Anderson. Oh, Karen Anderson, not Barbara. Karen, Karen. Anderson. Right. Oh. Well, Karen C.L. Anderson, who is a very gifted author and coach, she wrote the book, Difficult Mothers, Adult Daughters. So if you ever need a resource for mother-daughter relationships, good or bad, she is, she's I, I have one, one son um, and uh, it's just me. And, uh, yeah, and that's a lot. I mean, when you don't have, family. yeah, that's a lot. No, no family in um, New Jersey where I live. But... Where in New Jersey are you? I'm hundred in County. Oh, sure. I'm, I'm in Mercer. Oh, okay. So we're not probably alone. not alone. Yeah. <laughs> Have you found any, but any rebel groups? I know there's a lot of groups, but I don't know if there's one for parents of teenagers. I would think there would be. I mean, it would be a great group to start. I feel like I need to start one, but <laughs> so um, far, it would be a great group. I, I think you have a lot group. of people on it. Yeah, I think you would. <laughs> Right, because you, you would have you would have waiting lists for that group. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Now you're going to be busy starting a group, and I think there's a group for adult children. But gosh, there are a lot of midlife women who have teenagers right now, and that perimenopause, teenage hormones—it's just the perfect storm. It really is. Make sure to talk to your doctor about it too, because if you just had an ovary removed, you're yeah. also in wacky hormone stage. She said, give it, give it like, you know, a couple, couple weeks. She said, you might feel, you know, some hot flashes, but it should resolve because your left ovary will take, take over the, you know, whole, you know, the whole hormonal stuff. So. Colleen and Bridget, you guys told us about an organization that, um, that certifies gynecologists. For oh, NAMS, North American NAMS, Menopause. North American Menopause. Yeah, NAMS. Yeah, yeah NAMS. Yeah. I thought that was very, very helpful. Yes, if anybody uh, has questions, um, the North American Menopause Society is a great yes. resource on the website. It'll, it can recommend doctors because, you know, if yes. you have a doctor that isn't, and I'm not saying this is your history, so I'm saying in general, if you yes. have doctors that aren't answering your questions, there are certified doctors that can. So don't, and there's telehealth communities. Yeah. Now mm -hmm. online, like Genev, G-E-N-N-E-V, um, there's so many, Electra Health. Mm -hmm. There uh, are things out there. Yeah, there are resources out there, but gosh, women don't know about it. And it's just, it's such a disservice that we do. 
to midlife women that there aren't, you know, I don't want to see a commercial on my millennial children buying something with my credit card. I want to see what happens when I need something done. And there's just not a lot of resource out there. And Bridget just posted a couple of, so a lot of these have like communities and blogs that are interesting reads as well. Uh, if you Google NAMS, you'll find the website to where it is. And really, it, it is amazing. Having a NAMS uh, gynecologist is so important because I hear so many women say their gynecologist won't prescribe what they need or won't listen to what they need or brush off. And I'm not saying that about all gynecologists. There's great doctors out there, but I've heard that happen. And so the NAMS, if you find a NAMS doctor, they know they've gone through the training and the certification and they know. Right. And they'll also talk about, I know Tammy's mentioning, or I'm sorry, Marilyn's mentioning bioidenticals um, and they'll give you options. And that's what you want. You want options because every woman is different. Every woman's body goes through menopause differently, but you want options. You want to know that you're not crazy. Number one, your mental health is affected by perimenopause. So a lot of women don't know that. They think hot flashes, night sweats, I gain weight and that's it. No, you can have, you know, the migraines, the hormonal migraines, the anxiety, depression, it the all heart is, racing. Yeah. It's yeah. the perfect storm. Mm -hmm. So definitely NAMS. And I see that Tammy found her gynecologist for that site. And that was so, and check out the groups on um, Revel. I would be really surprised if there weren't one for mothers of surviving the alien teenage years, because I do think someone possesses your child at about 13 and they get themselves back around 18. Especially, then, especially the boys. Cause you know how we were talking earlier about how when women experience hormone fluctuations is when we tend to have that the mood disorders show up, like when we're pregnant or at postpartum or at puberty or at, um, at menopause and perimenopause. But for boys, think about the hormone fluctuation that's happening at 13. I mean, their testosterone and androgens are all over the place. I mean, so you have your hormones all over the place. He has his hormones all over the place. And what I was saying is that our friend Karen Anderson says it's two nervous systems colliding. It's not even people. It's just two <laughs> nervous systems that, are, that bump into each other from all that, you know, adrenaline and cortisol. That's it's a very it's a very chemical thing. It really is. Mm -hmm. But it's still draining. So even if you get a chance to just take a nice hot shower or something, just something to kind of release some of the tension yeah. in your body. Self-care yes. is not selfish. Self-care mm -hmm. is necessary, especially when you're dealing with, like you said, two hormonal people. Mm -hmm. And I wish we could stay on forever, guys. I really do. Um, but we're coming up to the top of the hour. <laughs> And this and is recorded. So we're going to, I hope to have this up on YouTube by next week on hot flashes and cold topics. So if you want to catch it, you can catch it there. And please check out Abby and Mag's um, website, the Anxiety Sisters. They have lots of information on there. They have the Spin Cycle podcast. They have the book, the Anxiety Sisters Survival Guide. Abby, thank you so much, Maggie. Thank you so oh, much, you guys. Too. We love coming to Hello Revel. We yeah, love it. We do. And anything with Bridget and Colleen. Aww. And, and anyone in this room. Anytime. We just <laughs> want to tell everyone in this room that we answer every email we ever get. It takes a couple days, but we get to everyone. So if you have something you want to talk to us about or a question, please email us at abs and mags at anxietysisters.com. And if you don't remember that, that's okay. Just go to the website and click on the contact us. I was going to say, can you put it in the notes? But if you could just go on, the you can just push, you can push the button. We also have a panic button on our website. So if yeah. you are, if you're, if you happen to be having a tough moment and you don't have a spin kit with you, hit the panic button and you will no longer feel alone. It's just, it's me. It's a recording of me. Nobody will come to your house. <laughs> <laughs> That's what people kept asking. Like, is someone going to come out? And I'm like, we could make someone come out to your house. Like you know. yeah, that would be a real trick. Yeah. If you yeah. That. yeah. All of a sudden you appear. Our, in our corporation, there's two employees. Mags and I are the president <laughs> and the janitors. Yeah. Like flying out across the country. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you guys so Thank much. You so really much. appreciate you. it. Everyone have a great day. Have a great Bye. day. Thanks. Bye. I'll stop Bye. recording. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye.